Hi, this is Mike Hendrickson from Software Architecture in New York City. I'm here with Peter Mark from Google. Peter, how you doing? Doing all right. So you're the global head of migration architecture. That's a lot to unpack. Can you <laughs> tell us a little bit about what that means and what you do? Sure, absolutely. So I'm part of the solution architecture team at uh, Google Cloud. And what our team does is we go to our largest and strategic customers to help solve um, problems that are either novel in size or in scope. So if our account teams have encountered something that is unusual or just really, really much larger than they're used to um, seeing, they'll call in some of uh, the members on our team. And we have different specialties, so people who specialize in machine learning or containers, DevOps, and so on. My specialty is migration. So when a customer is migrating something on a very large scale, say at a data center size or multiple data centers, they want to migrate that to the cloud, um, I would go in and talk to that customer with um, the account team. So do a lot of these large companies, are they stuck and you help unstick them? Um, in some cases, yeah. So when they're saying, we've progressed to this point, we're really not sure how to proceed, um, we're really not sure where to go or what's the best path or it, can you talk, bring somebody in who's got some experience doing this sort of thing. That's exactly where our team would come in and so help unstick these big customers. So, and one of the things that they're, I don't know if they're getting stuck with this a lot, but containers seems to be a huge topic nowadays. And mm -hmm. do you see a lot of buzz around that and are customers asking you about that or are, how are you helping them get through going from where they are today using containers and being in the cloud? Is that part of the migration? Absolutely, so we, we see a lot of excitement about in containers uh, coming from all our customers and developers. You know, containers is really important to Google. It's something that we've been doing for over 10 years now. We launch over four billion containers a week, which is kind of crazy. So it's really, it's something that's very important to us. And so when we started looking at creating a managed container service uh, a few years ago, um, we really wanted to do it in a way that met customers needs for the cloud, but also for what they were doing kind of anywhere else. And so we created Kubernetes, we open sourced it, and so we have this tool that you can run in Google Cloud or anywhere else, and it's the same tool. And so we really want to make this tool available to customers so that we can start creating an open source ecosystem around it. Kubernetes is free to use for anyone, and the community's really embraced it. And so we see a lot of tooling coming up around that. And we've seen customers running Kubernetes kind of all over the place, whether it's in our cloud, whether they're running in data centers and other clouds. That's really fantastic. And so what's happened in the last couple of years, I don't think there's been a single customer conversation that I've gone in on um, when we're talking about migrations where containers doesn't come up. Whether or not we're talking about you know applications were written 20 years ago or something that's still on the whiteboard, it always comes up because people are excited about it, people want to try it out because it's really just a progression towards abstracting away infrastructure away from developers. Just one more step, so developers have less to worry about, can write more consistent code that can be deployed everywhere. So everyone's really pretty excited about it. Is Kubernetes cloud agnostic? It really is, so yeah. Kubernetes is a platform for managing um, containers and we see it, like I said, deployed a lot on our cloud and we want to make sure you know it's the best place to run Kubernetes, but we certainly see a lot of customers running it in their own data centers, um, in other clouds, and really pretty much any situation. So another topic that I would imagine gets some of the larger partners that are trying to migrate stuck is hearing this term ter serverless. Is that a fad or is that something that they really have to consider and should consider? Or? We don't think it's actually a fad. Actually, I think it's been around for a long time. So if you th look at the history of what Google Cloud has done, our first um, service was uh, Google App Engine, which is essentially a serverless platform. You write an application, developer deploys it to App Engine, App Engine takes care of everything else. It um, deploys it, uh, can do different kinds of deployments, it can load balance it, scales it up, scales it down. Um, and that's really what a serverless platform is. What people are seeing today is things like uh, serverless functions being uh, deployed by different cloud services. It's really just a progression along the continuum of different levels of compute where you're trading off more operational overhead to have more control. So all the way on one end, it's virtual machines where you have total control, but more operational overhead. And all the way at the other end is functions where you have basically no operational overhead. All you have to do is write a function, but it's a total black box. It's just launched by triggers. And so this is really just a continuum of different levels of control. And so serverless is just another natural progression. We're seeing customers find out really interesting and innovative ways to use um, services like this um, in ways that we ha really haven't seen before. And so 
when you look at something like App Engine, which is, again, this kind of serverless platform, we have customers who have been on our platform for a long time. Something like Snapchat um, has been on App Engine since the day they launched. And, you know, they scale up and scale down with no problem and take some unholy percentage of teenage web traffic every day. Um, but we also have recent customers, something like uh, New York Times just moved their uh, crossword um, application stack to App Engine because they found that it scaled up and scaled down, met their needs really, really well. And actually, they're going to talk about that um, at this conference later on. So, does serverless <coughs> then kind of depend though on cloud services around it? I mean, or is it can you run it without cloud? I mean, well, it really kind of depends on what you want to do. I think um, there are some services and there are some products that exist kind of wherever you want to run them. Um, so. Things like uh, containers and Kubernetes and so on, I think that runs anywhere. And if you look at the um, open source ecosystem that has kind of sprung up around that and uh, is related to that, that exists anywhere. If you look at automation, if you look at um, continuous integration, continuous deployment, um, ser software configuration tools, those have existed um, in data centers, in cloud, and so on. And they all are part of a very significant larger movement in software development that's happened in the last couple of years that is certainly related to the advancement of cloud but is not necessarily dependent on it. You can run those systems kind of wherever you want and it actually leads to a greater independence of the platform where you're deploying your applications. So you're one of the few companies that I hear just say cloud rather than the Google Cloud or <laughs> the X Cloud or the other right. X Cloud. Or, so is it just the cloud for you guys? I mean are you really agnostic that that all these tools and technologies can and serverless can run on all clouds? So for a long time, Google has very much embraced uh, open source. We're very uh, proactive about releasing um, new technologies that we think uh, the community might be interested in, might be helpful, things like um, MapReduce and um, you know, Google File System and a lot of others. We, we've released these white papers, we've released open source tools like, uh, like I said, like Kubernetes, like TensorFlow, um, like Apache Beam, because we really want to support the open source community. We feel like we benefit a lot from it, and we feel like we should be giving back and showing the community um, what we find interesting, what we find novel and creative. Um, so there are this, these tools, these whole host of tools and libraries that will run anywhere. These are open source tools designed to run anywhere. And so there's a difference between, say, running Kubernetes in the cloud, which you could do in many clouds, or running a service, say a containerized service on Google Cloud, say with Google uh, Container Engine, or Kubernetes Engine, rather. Um, so there is a difference there between running in a cloud and running in our cloud, and certainly we strive to make our cloud the best cloud to run services in, but it doesn't change the fact that you could certainly run these in any cloud. Excellent. So of all the new technologies that are on the horizon, what do you, what do you see as the most impactful for developers, and let's take this on, on two fronts. One in the in the next 12 months, what do you think is going to just skyrocket up? And then if you look a little further on the horizon, like say five years from now, where do you think people are going to be and what is the technology that drives them there? Sure, so I think in the short term, what's really interesting, and this has been bubbling up for a while, so um, like I said, cloud enabled um, maybe the acceleration of more automation, which really kind of made lives easier for developers and started with things like um, on the operation side configuration tools of servers things like chef and puppet um, which have now been around for a while and then you got to a state where you could start having um, continuous integration tests running all the time on things like Jenkins and then you start do going from continuous integration to continuous deployment and now we're at a state where it's relatively straightforward for just about any company from the moment a developer um, commits code that they can see whether their tests pass. If they pass, they get packaged up, deployed, load balanced, formatted properly without anyone having to take manual steps. Steps that used to take, you know, teams of, of operations people, you know, days or weeks depending on the organization. And we've automated that entire right. pipeline and it's pretty straightforward. This is well understood stuff. And so we're at a point where that's now becoming standard and what's coming on top of that is as people break down these large monolithic applications into microservices and we have now hundreds and maybe thousands of microservices running around where previously people had one application, these things have to talk to each other. And so what I see ca happening in the kind of short term is more services coming along that help 
um, developers, help companies manage a whole fleet of microservices. So something like Istio, which is what yeah. they're describing as a service mesh, is really just coming, um, I, I think it's starting to peak, and people are going to find that incredibly useful as they start to decentralize all their application work and start making um, microservices. They're really going to find that very helpful. In the long term, I think there are kind of um, a couple of trends that I think uh, will be pretty obvious to anyone who's been watching. I think um, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence are going to start really becoming far more prevalent um, in terms of what people are doing, what people are deploying, um, the kind of applications they're looking at making. Because if you see, so from the large, um, say, technology companies, you see the rise of assistants, which are basically based on all this uh, machine learning technology behind them. This is only going to become more and more prevalent as um, our interaction mechanism with the cloud has gone from, say, in its earliest stages, um, the web, to now mobile is being, being more predominant. And I think the future is going to be more along the lines of actually just speaking out loud to the air and an assistant responding and doing these tasks for you. And so the interaction mechanism is going to become much more natural and fluid and even more abstracted away. So I think that's going to be a big deal in the next couple of years. Excellent. Peter Mark, we look forward to seeing that future unfold with right. you. Thanks, Thanks very much.